Welcome to New Realities. My name is Alan Steinfeld, and this program is about the exploration of different ways of thinking, of knowing, of understanding our world and who we are in that world. And the problem, as I see, is that we get fixed in seeing things in a certain way, and it becomes a limitation on the reality that we think is out there. So tonight's show is about really expanding our realities and expanding the way we think and, and how we act and our approach to the world. So my guest tonight is Helen Kramer, who's the author of this beautiful book, Liberating the Adult Within. Thank you, Helen. My pleasure, Helen. <laughs> and Helen's work is really about changing the way we think, our neurochemistry, our biochemistry, our, the way our neurons connect, and how to break out of the patterns of our conditional behavior. Right. Well, it's, it's, our, it, it's more than it conditioning. It's a combination of things. I was trained as a psychotherapist. Right. And when I started my practice, and I'm working with people, and I'm saying, what I learned doesn't make sense. In terms of pathologizing people, uh -huh. the idea that people are masochistic, or the idea that they're regressing, or that they're, they're choosing to suffer. Because nobody was born that way. Nobody was born that way. And I was, I was really, I've been blessed in many things in my life. One was having a lot of love early mm -hmm. in life. And that, in a way, led me to uh, the person I call my philosophical father, whose name was Kurt Goldstein. Mm -hmm. And he, he wrote about the human brain. He was a, a neuropsychologist. Uh, uh, and he believed that all li living organisms have one drive, and that's for mastery, to be the best that they can be. So he reacted against the whole Freudian oh. notion that we have a death instinct and the e and the e ego and superego are fighting. Mm. That makes sense. We're here to be the best, best. M the optimum at, at whatever it is. That's right. And so in, in my loft, I had, a, it, I had a plant, but it didn't get a lot of light because I'm on the second floor. So the plant, instead of growing up like this, grew like this. Uh, towards the light. Uh, towards the light. Yeah. And I said, we don't, we don't call that a bad plant because it's not straight and tall. But when, when we as human beings grow towards the light, mm. um, and, we're, and, and, and that may not allow us to function at our best, but we're, we're trying to get what we need to survive. Whatever that is, whatever's in our way, we're trying to grow right. around it. So what Kurt Goldstein said is that um, this drive for mastery is innate in all living organisms. But if the environment interferes, mm -hmm. then the organism can't grow to its full potential. And that was the example. But we'll grow partner. around it somehow anyway. Right. So but an example would be if w we know there are certain patterns. There are certain people that we say are caretakers. Right. Um, they're not trying to become martyrs. They're not trying to sacrifice themselves. But early on in life, mm -hmm. the way they're parents or the people closest to them, connected to them, was when they were caretaking. Mm. It's when so, they got the most love. It's when they felt the most nourished. Right. So b because for every child, connection is vital. Mm -hmm. And for adults, connection is vital, but even more so for children. We can't survive without connection as children. So if your way of, being, if your way of getting connection or attention was either being a caretaker or acting out, it's not because you innately want to act out or be a caretaker, mm -hmm. it's that you want the connection. Uh huh. So we did, we did certain behaviors that got us certain things, and, may, and it's gotten in the way of our optimal way of being. That's right. Because but the emotions fed us that we needed. Right. And so w what, what I would say to people is that we all have an idiosyncratic definition of love and connection. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at people and I say, okay, they have this drive for mastery, what got in their way? Mm -hmm. So I look at interferences, assuming that the interferences are not the way the person wants to be, so it's my job to help them f find out what the interferences are and then help them remove it. Mm -hmm. And with this approach, which is, I feel is a very positive approach. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I postulated something that I wrote about in this book because um, I kept seeing that when people were acting at their worst in, in terms of being unproductive or, mm -hmm. or um, in some way self-defeating, it was when they were stressed. Mm. And so I started to look at people and say, okay, what, ha has hap what happens when they get stressed? And I postulated that for most of our time on the planet, man lived in mortal danger. Mm -hmm. 
So if you've ever watched an, a nature show, right. if a predator comes into the herd, they signal each other immediately, get out of here. Right. So what I postulated was that um, our brains haven't evolved to tell the difference between stress and danger. So mm -hmm. that when we're stressed, the signal was going to the fight or flight part of the brain, mm -hmm. and we were reacting um, melodramatically, and I, I called it emotional dyslexia because mm -hmm. The signal goes to the wrong part of the brain, and we get a reaction that's the opposite of what we need. So let me understand. I mean, I think I'm understanding it, but it's like, so we're late for a meeting, and we're stressed because we're supposed to be at that meeting because we'll disappoint people and, and not make our commitment. So that same signal as if we're in mortal danger, which is stress, goes to the brain just because we're simply running late for something. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, but then, then what happens is that we, tr that we start we start to get melodramatic fantasies and we can't tell that... We like can't what would that be? Well, that um, my career is going to be ruined right. because I'm late for the meeting. Right. So then we go in there in this phobic state, uh -huh. then, we don't, then we don't talk up and make the contribution that we should have made. Right. So in, in a way, again, it, we, we're, we're behaving in a way that can't allow us to solve the problem. I'm late, what can I do? How can I structure the meeting? What can uh -huh. I say to people? Mm. so that I can get across what I want to get across rather than going into that phobic state mm. w which robs me of all my resources right. and, and, that, and, and living in that drama. Now fortunately, <laughs> ser serendipitously, I was writing, so I was teaching this work to therapists uh -huh. and it's very counter, first of all, the time I was doing this work in the late 80s, mm -hmm. There was no such thought that the brain was was plastic that it could change, and right. I was saying we can train ourselves out of that reflex. It's a biological reflex, mm -hmm. again, meant for life and death. That situation. association is a bio. Yeah. The the fact that the that the the um, stimulus is going to that part of the brain because, right. the, as I said, the brain hasn't evolved to distinguish stress from danger. Mm -hmm. So um, while I was writing the uh, proposal for my book, somebody sent me an article from the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. by a beautiful, wonderful man named Joseph Ledoux, who's a very world-renowned neurobiologist, mm -hmm. and he had proven that my theory was correct. Your theory being that you can separate stress, ordinary stress, from de that, that most range. of the reactions that w we see that are melodramatic mm -hmm. and childlike um, are coming are, are, are coming from a stress response, mm -hmm. and that. What, see, what, ha what happens in traditional psychotherapy too often is, so somebody's acting rigid or jealous or melodramatic in some way, so it looks very childish, and then the therapist will talk about your childhood. Right. But in a way, that just takes you back into that cycle. Oh, I see. Instead of saying, okay, w what was the stress? Now let's look at another way to react to that stress, because we have, when we're very... Uh, small children, we have the primitive part of our brain and then our neocortex mm -hmm. develops and then we have more cog right. cognition. The primitive part is more active because it needs to control the biology at that moment. And, and it takes a while. Human beings develop slowly, so right. it takes a while for, the, for our cognitive capacities to, to develop. Right. So in, in my work, what I'm trying to do, and in the book I have charts, uh -huh. and I'll say, okay, if you have these thoughts, and, and I, and I sort of talk about the internal voice that you'll be using, uh -huh. you know, nothing ever works for me, you know, everybody else has all the luck, I don't, you know, right. that, that is, that's coming from that child brain, the fight, flight, or freeze part of the brain, and I teach people how to transform that same feeling mm -hmm. into something that reflects them as an adult with adult resources, mm -hmm. so that they can, they can, mm -hmm. They're not reliving their childhood over and over and over again. Well, how do we do that? Let's say, you know, I get into the drama, I'm late for a meeting, and I feel it's like, you know, that, that fantasy projection of like this is, you know, how do I separate? How, what's a practical way of working with you? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, someti sometimes, um, and I don't know how many people in the audience will have this experience, but sometimes I'll say to somebody, well, if, if, if your child was reacting this way and you wanted to comfort them, or if a very good friend uh -huh. was reacting that way, what would you say to them? And most people will come up with something 
that is compassionate. Right. It's okay. People know that you're you're you know you're always on time. You're responsible. Right. So you you reassure the person, and that's what we should be doing to ourselves. Mm. Right. You talk to the adult part of you. Talks to the child part of you. Right. And I, I have um, I have a little formula in the, in the book, and it's when you feel something melodramatic happening, mm -hmm. stop and say. But but we're not clear enough to know it's melodramatic because we're so get caught up in it. Well, that's why that's why in the book I really spell it out for people. Uh -huh. This is what you'll be thinking. This is what you'll be saying to yourself. This is what you'll be imagining other people are saying to mm -hmm. you. Because the, the, the pro one, of, one of the biggest problems in human existence is that if we're constantly being triggered into the fight, flight, or freeze part of the brain, mm -hmm. we can't be generous. Right. We can't be productive. We, we're combative. We, it, it stimulates a phobicness or a mild paranoia. Mm -hmm. And then we feel like we have to attack and defend ourselves, mm -hmm. and so we're we're living with much more hostility, and we're not, w w again, because our culture hasn't recognized how profound this reflex is, and how much it interferes with our lives mm -hmm. all day long. That feeling that um, women walking around feeling I'm too fat, all this negative self-talk right. is all coming from that part of the brain and diminishing us mm. and again it it creates in our culture which i think is so prominent right now adversarial relationships yeah with each other and with ourselves and, exactly. we, and we get in our own way and so your way of breaking these patterns is not just talking to ourselves but you're sort of doing things to rewire right and and, and and in, in general the, the technique and people can practice it yeah. Um, if you if you had if you have self talk like um, I'm never good enough I'm yeah uh, right so I would say to a person okay I'd like you to resurrect a memory mm -hmm. of when somebody gave you good feedback or when you felt very good about something that you did okay I okay? can do that and then um, there's a breathing technique that I use because it it lowers um, cortisol levels and it lowers, uh, cortisol is the hormone that our adrenals mm -hmm. put out when we're stressed. So if the brain goes into the stress response, signals the adrenals, danger, 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 the cortisol goes up. That's why a lot of people have insomnia when they have very stressful times oh, in life. Oh, is that why? As a matter of fact, yeah, I mean, that's what sleeping medications uh, are, are so prevalent because oh. our, our lives are so fast paced mm. and so stressed without enough support so that we're putting out so much cortisol that it keeps us awake. So with this breathing technique it changes how, what right. is the technique? So the technique is that you put your hands on your belly right? and you inhale to the count of four you, you, and you fill up your belly. You and can talk, you can okay. actually say that to the camera. Okay, so you, what you're going to do is you're going to inhale to the count of four and then filling up your belly and then exhale like you're blowing out a candle to the count of eight. Now. Be aware, you know, when I'm watching people, mm -hmm. I can say, a lot of people breathe with their shoulders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I see. You, you don't need your shoulders to breathe. You can, you can be sitting back or at mm -hmm. a chair or lying down, and it's just a gentle filling up of the belly and then a gentle blowing out. If you do that a few times, it prepares you for a positive experience because you've lowered your cortisol. Oh, I see. So, so then I ask people, so now go into the memory, and somebody where I might say, um, they did something at work that was very well received and, mm -hmm. and they got good, good connections from people. Right. So I'll ask them, okay, now close your eyes now that you've done the breathing right. and remember what that felt like. Th and they'll say, and, and typically people say that, that feel, it feels really good. And I'll say, okay, now, because this is an important point. How do you know it feels good? What sensations mm. are you feeling in your body? Right. And the interesting thing is that most people know when they're feeling bad, but they don't know when they're feeling good. They don't know what a good sensation is. Right. So, wow. so I may have to start and say, okay, have you ever been on the beach or out in the country and you felt the warm sun on your skin? Mm. Can you close your eyes and mm. just feel that warmth? Mm. Because we have to wake ourselves up. We're a mm. little anesthetized because we're so stressed and right. many of us have had 
our own pain and trauma growing up and we learned to turn off the pain because mm. we didn't want it to overwhelm us right. and in the process we turned off all the good feeling so but but getting back to the breathing and then we know we're feeling good then that rewires our Th brain that, yes because when when so so ultimately people will say something like oh i feel i feel warmth in my chest i feel a smile on my face mm -hmm. i feel easy in my belly in order to produce those warm feelings or those relaxed feelings you are actually creating new neurotransmitters and new neural pathways right because neurons that fire together wire together exactly yes. and um, one of my theories about change is mm -hmm. most people know what they're doing that's not working right trying to stop what you're doing that doesn't work um, it is usually not easy to do so my my theory of change is replace it with something that feels better okay so no but yeah no I have a pattern that I really need to break is that you know I'm trying to complete this project and I keep resisting but I want to do it and it's like I just need to break through my resistance which is a pattern of distraction and stay focused how do you know what I'm saying yes so uh, what would you do for me doctor? I, it, it reminds me it reminds me of a session I had with a 12 year old okay, I feel like in, that. In, in Milan who's, yeah. whose mother works with me and she said does Helen have any tricks for me because I I, I procrastinate and I can't get my homework done. yeah so uh, um, so I want to ask you when you are focused how do you feel I feel really good and feel centered and and aligned and, and happy. Okay, well, I think there were a couple of things going on, but I'm going to give you one no, tool please. for right Thank now. Thank you. Um, I would like you to do the breathing and practice feeling yourself as the person who is focused and how that feels. To train yourself, y your whole being, to live in that state. Mm. Because because you have some old identity that's getting in the way. Yes, I do. And and these old identities, you know, they're hardwired in, they're reflexive, and what does reflexive mean? They happen automatically. We don't right. have to think about them. Right, right. It, because it's it's be, it's become your default. When we produce any emotion, if we had a lot of sadness in our lives early on. The actual emotion of sadness is formed by amino acids that come together and form peptides. Right. All of our cells have receptor sites for peptides on them. Right. When, the, when our cells divide, they produce new cells that are saying, give me that peptide, give me that peptide. We get addicted to the emotion. Just yes. like you're addicted to... Ha so, so I get addicted to not being focused. But I want to ad help you get addicted to being focused. Yes, so... So you have to practice that. Oh, I have And you can tell you a story. Uh -huh. I had I had a woman who used to take the bus in from mm -hmm. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I open up the door and she's dressed very well that day, so I compliment her and she bites my head <laughs> off. <laughs> so I said so we sat down, she said, I don't know what's going on with me. I was picking a fight with you on the bus coming in. I was thinking of things I could fight with right. you about. In her history, her mother had was almost catatonic. Uh -huh. And so the only and she was a little kid. The only way mm. she'd get her mother's attention was to fight. So she, ho the wires got crossed. If I need attention or I need support, I'll pick a fight. Mm -hmm. She lost so many friends that way. Mm -hmm. What happens is that if we haven't created a new way of nourishing ourselves, we will go back to patterns from childhood. So it connects us. It's like we're not alone if we're in that dynamic. We become mm -hmm. the child and the parent. I have, based on, on uh, the work I was talking about, mastery, I have my theory of positive intent. At those moments, you're not trying to sabotage yourself. No, you're I, trying no. to be connected in a way that you were connected before. Uh, wait, I'm trying to, uh, let me integrate. That's a new thought. So, that, so uh, it's a, it's a way of dealing with our existential aloneness to become our own parent, even if that parent is not uh, a good force in our right. lives. I had an experience, you know, we all have stresses in our life. Right. I lost my husband a few years ago. My mm. mother's an invalid. There were mm. so many emergencies, and I remember I'm, I'm sort of going, I, I'm sitting there trying to get myself together and figure out how to deal with all these emergencies, and I started to get worked up. Right. And just like that, I started to sing "Keep Your Sunny Side Up," uh -huh. and I realized all the work I was doing 
and, and keeping myself from living in that part of the brain was paying. So I had a laugh, and I said, mm -hmm. here, now that's a reflex. Keep your sunny side up is a reflex instead of getting frustrated. But, so that's a really good point. So when we have these patterns that we know aren't really serving us, we, we retrain ourselves before the patterns kick in. Like even if you're smoking cigarettes, you, you see, not that I am, but you see how good it feels not to smoke, and you start to rewire the brain to know you feel good without that habit. Yeah, and another little tool that you can use is uh -huh. um, if you can imagine that there's a movie screen in front mm -hmm. of you and there's a line down the middle and on the left side see the old pattern like mm -hmm. you know I'm starting to work and then I'm interrupting. Right. On the on the right side is the new pattern mm. and now look at the screen and say I can choose which side would you choose to be on? Right, the side that's focused. I've really made a study of what gets in our way of yeah, changing. Yeah, I think that's great. And one of the things that gets in the way of changing is what I call existential anxiety. Right. I know my, uh, this is me. Right, I'm the type of person that does this, and if I wasn't, so Who would I be? Who would I be? <laughs> I'd be not the person I thought I was. But it's, it, it, that's why I really believe, one, one of my biggest beliefs in life is that we need support. We need support through that existential anxiety. You know, whether it's talking to friends or having some kind of coach or somebody that helps her. or something, yeah. Yeah, well, I call myself an educator now. I don't call my, mm. I'll, only for insurance purposes, I say I'm a psychotherapist, but mm. I call it emotional education because it's teaching people things they didn't learn before. It's not that they're sick mm. and they need to be fixed, mm, mm. if that makes sense to you. It does make sense because, you know, like you said in the beginning, our optimum st is to be the best we can be. We all want to be that way. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I, so it, it really irritates me when people say, Oh, they're in love with their suffering, and they and they do this to themselves. Nobody really is. It's just a lot. They get attached to a pattern that was that was imposed on them. They didn't create the pattern. Mm. If if you if the only way if the only way you could get attention was to be a caretaker, and the only way you could get connection, right? It, you didn't you didn't decide one day to become a martyr, right? No, it's so good. The other thing that you talk about is like. At least I'm a little aware of my patterns. That when people have real trauma, there's this post-traumatic stress syndrome, right. and that goes much deeper in some people. How do you work with something that's like, I guess, in the same way, so you know, disconnected from the conscious level of functioning? How would you work with that? Well, I think you know, I look at all behavior on a on a continuum. So you you've got you know the acute post-traumatic stress here, mm -hmm. and then most of us have some repeat of stress uh -huh. that's not as acute. So to me it's it's it, it's it's very similar. Mm -hmm. It's really important to get support. Mm -hmm. You know, I I've intuited a lot of things about the brain, but I love the brain research because it shows that we we are designed. We have empathy neurons. We're designed to connect to each other. Mirror neurons. And mirror neurons. Yeah, yeah. people call them different things. Yeah. Some people think that that the empathy neurons actually allowed us to communicate without talking, that we were, right. we, it, it has a telepathic quality to it. If, if, if you've been stressed, and that means something harsh. Yeah, something severe has come in. Uh, you need the energy of a, um, of a person who's looking at you with compassion. Oh, who's, I mean, without empathy, judgment. Without judgment. To free us from that. And to, and to teach us how to treat ourselves that way. Uh -huh. Because the, the, the being judgmental is something that we learned in our culture. Oh, right. So we even judge ourselves because of the trauma and all of that. So. Right. And, and you know, I know when I work with people and I've said to them, can you feel some compassion for yourself? And they'll say, I know what it's like to be c compassionate to somebody else, but I don't know what you mean. Mm. Can I feel compassion for myself? Mm. And so I teach them. And I say, I have compassion because I see your dignity. Mm. I see your desire to feel good. Mm. I see what got in your way. Mm. We, you know, w we need to be teaching this to our children. I mean, this is like liberating the adult because we. So only when we teach it to children will we grow up to be healthy adults. Children get it like that. They change mm. so quickly That's because. Good. They, well, the patterns are in is ingrained. We're almost out of time, but I did want to ask you one question because uh, how does this lead to a spiritual fulfillment? Okay, it's a good question. Yes. And my 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 um, publisher made me ch take my chapter of spirituality out oh, of here. Oh, they shouldn't. Uh, I know. Uh, I know. Anyway. They but, weren't. But just tell us because we're. Oh yeah. If you if you can live without the judgment and without the fear, it's a natural evolution to become spiritual. Mm -hmm. But many people are trying to be 
take on spiritual philosophies, but nobody's helping them with, with the drama and the fighting that's going on and the, and the phobicness that's going on. So they don't really benefit enough from the spiritual teachings because they're at war with themselves or they feel at war with other people. They expect mm. to be judged. They expect to be blamed. Right. So it, uh, the, it, taking care of this will lead to a kind of opening. That's right. And then you can find whatever in the universe appeals to you on a spiritual level. But I believe it's, it's natural for all of us to evolve to that mm. when, we, when we can take care of this. So it's beautiful because you are dealing with our natural evolution. You're getting us back to being the beautiful flowers of expansion. That's right. That's really our, 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 our essential nature is to uh -huh. be that way. Well, we'll do more shows. This went really quickly because yeah, there was just so much information. This is Helen Kramer and her book, Liberating the Adult Within, which is very deep in restructuring a sort of process that we're involved with, but how can people find you? Um, I have a, a website, pcs100.com. Um, I have an organization, that's, that's my organization, so, and my email is r-e-a-l-s-o-l-1 at aol.com. It's short for Real Solutions. Real Solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, yeah, this was great. Really nice. Thank I mean, you. I learned a lot, and you know, I always do the show so I can be the better, better person as well. So well, you're, it's you're delightful. You're really <laughs> delicious. Well, you helped me. You helped me with a couple of things that I didn't see, and now I see a bigger picture. Yeah, and you see that, that this is a much more educational than a pathological psychotherapy model. Yeah. No, I think it's a whole tr new trend in, in therapy that's so much, it feels so much better. Yeah, because it, 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 it again, I, we, we all want to feel good about ourselves, and I feel this approach, I, I feel so lucky. I get to work with people and help them develop their own sense of goodness. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think it's the kind of spiritual philosophy that uh, psychotherapy always needed, you know, and, and Freud was in his own way. You know, Freud has own blocks that he then projected onto the culture. A and then there becomes all this negative, you know, right. pathologizing right. about our behavior. This is New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld. Email me at newrealities at earthlink.net and check my website, newrealities.com.